May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Our gospel passage today is another of those passages that can be confusing to the modern Western hearer. Um, We have two characters here, the judge and the widow. And there are a few points about them that I think will help to bring the parable into sharper focus. First of all, the judge. This judge does not fear God or regard man. That's what it says in our translation. Some translations say that he doesn't respect men. Now, you might hear that and think that it means he is impartial. He is not a respecter of persons, just like God is not a respecter of persons, right? But that's not what this is about. Um, The point here is that he is shameless. You can't shame him. Middle Eastern culture to this very day is primarily um, a shame-based culture. In our culture, we might try to convince someone of right and wrong based on their intellect. We appeal to their reason. But in a shame-based culture, right and wrong are based more closely on relationships and feelings. We tend to cheer for people who fight for what's right no matter what people think of them, right? And that's fine, but Jesus' original listeners would have shamed people into doing what everyone thought was right. Do you see the difference? All of this to say that the judge is not a good guy to deal with. He doesn't consider himself to be judging on God's behalf, right? So you can't appeal to his mind about what God says is right. And he also doesn't care what other people think of him. He cannot be shamed into doing the right thing either. The only way to influence this job is probably to bribe him. Right? Either with money or with some other thing to his benefit. So that's the judge. Then there's the widow. The hero of this story is a woman. And not just any woman. Widows in general are considered the most vulnerable adults in a traditional society like this one. Whether or not we approve of the system, most women in that society required protection and provision from their menfolk. But this also produces an interesting byproduct of chivalrous behavior toward women. Okay, ladies, the reason chivalry is dead is because you no longer need it, (laughs) right? So, So women can get away in this culture with a lot of things that would get a man killed, partly because they are dismissed as irrelevant, right? But also partly because they are treated with a kind of backward respect and forbearance and honor even, by the men who feel responsible for them, right? So a woman in this culture didn't ever go to court. A man would go for her. You may find that insulting, but that's the way this culture works. The fact that this woman has to go to court for herself tells us that she is the most vulnerable of a vulnerable class. Not only is she a widow, she has no adult menfolk at all. No father, no brother, no uncle, no cousin, no son, not even any in-laws. She may have female relations, so she may or may not be all alone, but when it comes to this legal stuff, she is entirely on her own. And that is why she is in court in the first place. So here we have 
a judge who can only be influenced by bribes. He doesn't care about God, and he doesn't care what people think. How is such a man to be worked on, right? He doesn't care if everyone in the town goes around saying, there's that judge who robbed that poor old lady and who, no one had to, had, she, who had no one to care for her. Where is his shame? And we have a woman who is publicly vulnerable and easy prey and probably doesn't have any way to counter the bribes being offered by her opponent. What will she do? In the end, she adopts a very simple strategy. Her strategy is to pester the judge to death. And there are stories like this that come out of the Middle East about this very kind of thing happening. She keeps coming and shouting at him in public regardless of the fact that he has already rendered a verdict. Now, a man doing this would have been hauled away forthwith. Right? But the judge isn't going to do that himself to this woman and everyone else sees that the widow's case was misjudged, they know that this judge neither fears God nor is able to be shamed by man. And so they're all sitting back amused by the interaction between this judge and the woman he has wronged. There goes Mrs. Cohen again after Judge Abrams. (laughs) She just won't give up. Good for her. I wonder how long he's going to go on like that. And of course, she gets her way in the end, simply because the judge doesn't want the headache. Now, it may sometimes seem to us that God is like the judge in this parable. We are such small creatures that we cannot see what he is doing, even in our own lives, much less further out. He seems capricious and mean, right? We experience injustice, or we see the suffering of others, and God doesn't seem to care. But Jesus makes it clear that God is not like that. He says, if the widow can get her way from someone like that, just by keeping at it, why would you give up on God who is a loving father? And will God vindicate his elect who cry to him day and night? I tell you, he will vindicate them speedily. God is a just judge. And Jesus Jesus isn't just words either. He tells us, and then he shows us. He's on his way to Jerusalem in this passage. And we see in the image of Jesus Christ on the cross before us every week, a true picture of who God is. He is the one who wants to bless us and vindicate us so much that he will give himself to the horror and pain and humiliation, not only of the incarnation, but also of the crucifixion, in order to bless us and vindicate us. The only question, the only question is whether we will trust him Enough to continue to pray. I must tell you that there are times when I find it hard to continue to pray. And I'm sure you do too. But that is the question. We have another example today in Jacob. Jacob has nowhere else to run and so he wrestles with this supernatural man who appears and he holds on 
This is, this is usually considered an angel, but it's, it's kind of unclear. Many of the, of the early church fathers thought that this was a pre-incarnation appearance of the second person of the Trinity. This is Jesus, right? We don't know that for sure. It kind of seems like it. But in any case, he is a messenger from God with the power to bless And Jacob simply holds on for dear life. Wounded, maimed, cast out, afraid. He just holds on. And he says, I won't let go until you bless me. Will we hold on? Like Jacob. Will we hold fast to the end? Will we trust that what we see in Jesus is actually a true picture? That what we know is true, in spite of the fear and the suffering that we may experience right now? Our gospel reading cuts off the last line of the last verse of the passage. Jesus actually ends the parable with a question. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? The answer to that question is up to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.